Hello everyone. Welcome once again to MTS, Minds Technology of Society, uh, hosted by the Cognitive and Information Sciences Group here at UC Merced uh, with generous sponsorship from the Glushko and Samuelson Foundations. Our speaker today is Professor Andy Clark. Uh, Andy is Professor of Logic and Metaphysics at the University of Edinburgh. He's a looming figure in the philosophy of mind and philosophy of cognitive science and uh, has done very important and influential work on extended cognition, artificial intelligence, and related topics. Uh, and so, uh, for those of you who know who he is, I don't have to keep talking, and those who don't, you'll find out soon enough. So without further ado, Andy Clark. Great to be here. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. It, 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 it. Am I coming through? Do I need to wear a mic, or shall I just shout? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so I kind of slightly fear that this might be a little bit too introductory for some people here um, from conversations I've been having today. But I'm going to do it anyway because they're the slides that I got ready. Um, <laughs> it, it does get to uh, to some more nitty gritty issues towards the uh, the latter sort of quarter. So. Um, I should say thanks to some people, particularly Carl Friston um, and to the various universities. I should say thanks to my group, uh, the EXPECT group at Eddie Murray University, who uh, are working on, at the moment, consciousness and predictive processing. Um, it's a long story why we're even trying to do consciousness. But, uh, I won't be talking about consciousness today at all, I promise. Right. So the conclusions of, uh, of the talk are that I think it I think this kind of story, the predictive processing story, really could be one of those sort of game changers for philosophy and cognitive science in roughly the sort of way that connectionism was, in roughly the way that embodied cognition was. It's not to say it solves all the problems, but it's a kind of paradigm that can change the way that you think about all the problems you've already got. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that can be useful. Um, I think also, one as a philosopher at least, one of the things that interests me about it is that I think it's one of those stories that sort of does reach somehow into lived human experience. I think it's got sort of phenomenological credentials, um, and they will come out a little bit during the talk. Okay. But there are problems. Uh, the problems are that uh, the story has a kind of scope and sweep and ambition to actually run into all kinds of sort of deep conceptual and methodological problems, I think. And so uh, a good sort of, pretty much half the talk is looking at those problems. So here's the plan. I'm going to sketch the core story. That's a bit that I'm worried will be far too introductory and sketchy, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. Uh, I'll worry about it, and I will conclude that everything's fine after all. <laughs> so the core story is just um, the predictive processing story that you take your typical view of perception and you kind of turn it a bit upside down. It's not totally upside down. It's more like you just start stressing uh, one direction when you might have stressed the other direction more. And it might not even look upside down to you, having been sort of steeped in kind of, you know, inference-based <coughs> processing and so on for a long time. But if you were Descartes, it probably would be a little bit surprising, you know, if you thought that what perception was all about was a kind of imprinting on the senses of information from the world, and so uh, you would kind of process that in richer and richer ways until you got your world model. Uh, what these stories really do is say, you know, we're going to start with your world, world model and use that to make sense of the incoming sensory evidence. And it might seem a bit surprising if you were David Marr as well, because, you know, um, for all of the, the sophistication of the Marr story, it was principally a feed-forward story. Um, and if you look at um, cognitive neuroscience textbooks, this is Kandel, you know, it's, it's still pretty much the case that the arrows point forwards. The arrows come inwards from the sensory peripheries, despite the fact that everybody knows, and Kandel, of course, knows that, um, that a huge amount of uh, the connectivity is running in the other direction. So maybe what's been missing is a fundamental story about that other direction, and that's what I think is on offer here. So, um, PP just tries to reverse this. The idea is that the job of the brain is to predict the current sensory signal by constructing it for itself using what it knows about the world. 
So it's very much the core of this story is about predicting the present. It's not really about predicting the future. Something that has been coming up quite a lot in conversations today. I think it. I think your grip on the present phases seamlessly into looking into the future here. But for thinking about the basic perception case, it really is predicting the current sensory evidence on the basis of your best model of how the world's most likely to be. So, so there's two elements in the story. One is the use of a probabilistic generative model, and the other is the use of predictive coding. So of these two elements, I would happily bet quite a lot of money on um, probabilistic generative models turning out to be an important part of the story that cognitive science needs to tell about intelligent response. I, it's not to say it might not turn out to be false, but I'd be really surprised if it did. But the other bit, uh, I think, really is a hostage to fortune, uh, and it's a very specific claim about how the generative model is used. The idea is that it's used to predict the current waves of sensory input so that the only stuff that is then further processed, gets to drive further processing, is deviations from what was predicted. So that's a sort of, this is, you know, the commercial predictive coding, motion compressed video, all of that kind of, that kind of predictive coding. It really is just applied in this hierarchical setting. So each layer is trying to predict the layer below and all that gets to move forward through the system to drive more work is the error uh, between the prediction and the evidence. Okay. So, so generative models, um, quick intro to those, they're probably very familiar, but what's important about them in these stories is that they're sort of bodies of knowledge that are structured enough to be able to generate plausible instances for themselves, if you like. Um, so because you know enough about the probability, probabilities of different patterns in the data, you can construct sort of um, simulated versions of that data that look pretty much like the data that, uh, that you trained the model on in the first place. So this means working a little bit more like a computer graphics program than like a pattern recognizer. It's more like you know how to make these patterns. And if you've got to do recognition, you use what you know about how to make the pattern to do the recognition. So lots of examples, uh, an image grammar would be a simple example, a low dimensional generative model for images. You can learn one of these just by um, throwing an awful lot of natural images at a fairly standard sort of structured neural network and getting it to learn how to create images like that for itself. So these are the things you'll see from some of the deep mind type folk. Uh, natural images like that train up the generative model to produce its own best chops at things like that. And you probably can't really see much difference between these two. Uh, if you looked very hard uh, at them, you might see odd things. I think there's a sort of pulsing baby head in there somewhere. <laughs> there's a few, kind of, a few weird things. But at, at first glance, it's doing pretty well. Uh, so, you know, it's also true that you can use the same technique to um, project the image slightly into the future. So you can generate little short videos that show how a scene like that might unfold. And of course, it's not using much knowledge to do that. It's pretty well pixel level knowledge. But the idea would be that if you had that sort of understanding of the world sort of filtered through a deep hierarchical model, well, maybe that's what it is to understand the world, to be able to get to grips with the sensory signal in a way that reaches into the future on the basis of the past. So crucially, so I mean, predictive processing isn't deep mind stuff. There's a big difference between how these things work. The deep mind stuff kind of trains up its system and then amortizes the knowledge in the system into something that is going to be a nice, efficient, feed-forward um, solution. PP doesn't do that. It doesn't amortize the knowledge. The idea is that, um, that you use top-down prediction all the time to try to get to grips with the current sensory signal. Um, so it's not got, I, it, it doesn't even have a pure feed-forward option built in, although some versions of it do, the David Heger's version does. So the goal in PP is for the top-down prediction, filtered through all these many sort of hierarchical levels, to explain away the incoming sensory signal. That means um, matching it to whatever tolerance of noise the the system estimates to be okay right now. So 
how much of a match you need will vary moment by moment and task by task. And this is where, as a, a, a philosopher, I, get to, I can ask you to make a huge leap of faith. The idea would be, well, that's what mind and intelligence is. Mind and intelligence just is that, um, done using multiple different kinds of neural resource, operating at multiple different time scales, drawing on many different kinds of information. So, you know, there's no limit to what kind of stuff accumulated at what kind of time scale you could use to perform this prediction task. Um, for example, you could use information about the nature and properties of worldly stuff and events. That's the obvious stuff that you might use. You could also use information about how things change over time. You could use information about how things would alter if you were to intervene on the scene. So you can learn through action how the scene would change if you poked and prodded it in certain ways. Um, information about your own current physiological state. So the fact that my heart is beating a little bit faster right now, that is kind of evidence here for a certain sort of grip on the world uh, that can be taken into account just as well as any other piece of evidence. So all of those things can inform this process of top-down um, prediction, and they all have to settle into a kind of coherent whole. That would be the, the picture here. So there's a, the kind of thought that I like here is that, um, that if you were a creature that perceives the world in this kind of way, you would thereby be a creature that understands the world to a certain degree, and you'd also be a creature that's positioned to imagine its world. So you could sort of... Uh, run through simulations of how things would go were you to do so and so because these resor resources are all kind of rolled into the generative model. Think of it as a, a single generative model of embodied exchange with the world. And of course you chuck into that, as I've just been stressed in, this predictive coding claim, there is a particular claim about how top down meets bottom up. So you know, in a way there's lots of ways that you could combine top-down information and bottom-up information to drive a response. But one rather elegant way of doing it is to assume that all you need to attend to, all you need to, as it were, allow to further influence the processing is stuff that um, escaped your prediction at time t. So that's why prediction error becomes a big player. Prediction error is what carries the news. News is always relative to a model, relative to a prediction. There's no sort of, there's nothing, nothing gets computed here except relative to a model. Right. So prediction error becomes a kind of anti-hero or hero of this family of models. And in fact, people do often say, and I know what they mean, although I think it might be an over-dramatization, that the flow of prediction error here replaces sensory information. So early on in this sort of um, process, uh, incoming sensory evidence has been converted into prediction error which carries the news. It's important that these prediction errors will be very, very specific. They'd be carrying very detailed contents about, as it were, what isn't, what isn't there. Um, so they really are sensory information. They're, they're just sensory information of a particular kind, is the way that I would rather put this. Okay. So what can you do with them? Well, the prediction error signal, I like it because it's a signal around which a system can self-organize very well. Prediction error is something that you can calculate, and once you've got it, you can use it to, if you like, draw in uh, whatever resources are most apt to reduce that particular kind of prediction error with that particular kind of weighting. Right, so yeah, yeah, other things you can do with it, of course, are um, if you can't get rid of it, then you can use it to drive plasticity. So persistent prediction error will drive postsynaptic plasticity so you can learn a better model. Yeah, and in PP, this is I think where PP gets its flexibility power and is one of the reasons why it's so hard to falsify. Um, in PP, the whole process is orchestrated by self-estimated sensory uncertainty, the precision of the prediction error signal. So roughly, roughly how, real, how reliable do you take that bit of prediction error to be for the task at hand? Um, the inverse variance of the, of the signal. So what that does is it weights predictions or prediction errors according to something like reliability for this task 
now, given everything that I know about the world. So it's a sort of atheist. Statistically, it's the inverse variance of the prediction or the prediction error signal, um, mostly applied to prediction error. Doesn't really matter, you get the same effect either way. So what precision weighting does is it turns up the volume on select error signals at every single level of processing. So it's not something that only happens at the bottom level or something like that. And it varies the balance between top down and bottom up and between different neural areas. So um, by changing the flow of precision weightings, you can change the influence that one neural area has on another, another neural area. Um, Spinal tap fans will notice, the, uh, will notice the volume controls. These are the good volume controls that go up to 11. Is the um, so the upshot is that the precision of sensory prediction error becomes a big player in these stories. Um, a very big player. I mean, just about everything that is currently being written about psychopathology in these areas is, is sort of turning on disturbances to that precision weighting mechanism. And you can see why. If you assign too much precision to sensory prediction error, you won't be able to detect a faint pattern in a noisy environment. So, you know, you'll all know that there's a Dalmatian in there. Most of you can probably see it. Um, but if you assign too much weighting to sensory prediction error, you wouldn't be able to use your knowledge about the world to, as, as it were, treat some bits of the sensory signal as noise so as to extract the Dalmatian from that picture. And there's some speculation at the moment that maybe this sort of uh, thing is involved in autism spectrum disorder, that, um, as it were, by uh, assigning too much precision to sensory information, you make it hard to bring that information under the sort of schematic control of uh, your top-down grip on how the world is, and even to develop that grip. But, if you do it the other way around too, that's going to be problematic as well, because if you assign too little precision to sensory prediction error, um, too much to top-down prediction, you'll start to see what you expect to see. And that can't be a very good thing either. Um, there's some experiments, some of you will know the famous white Christmas experiments where undergraduates were told there would be a very faint um, sample of white Christmas, white Christmas, a song starting up within a sound file and um, many, a substantial number of undergraduates, and then it was done with other populations too, you'll be glad to hear, did note the onset of white Christmas, but there was no onset of white Christmas, it was just a white noise file. Um, and this is again just this, um, this ability that we have to discard some things, treating them as noise, and to extract patterns that we strongly expect in that way, a bit like seeing faces in the clouds, I guess. So some nice illustrations of this by some um, people at the University of Sussex. They had a generative network that they um, forced the higher levels to start predicting the presence of dogs in the input stream. So it was sort of seeded with dog expectation at a fairly high level. Uh, and then they probed what, uh, uh, what the sort of visual information that uh, the system was getting looked at through that lens. So um, what you can see this, hang on, let me give you it. Um, it's a nice video. Yeah. So this is the Sussex campus under strong dog prediction. <laughs> dogs, <you know. laughs> there are dogs in the clouds. If you do happen to look up at the clouds, there are dog faces all over the place. Um, so they were interested, that group were particularly interested in um, how people rated these kind of clips relative to psychedelic experiences and they had people filling in questionnaires about this and so on. So there is a, a pretty direct link from these predictive processing accounts to psychopharmacological models and speculations. Um, Corlett and colleagues are, are doing a lot of this work. Um, they like to relate the chemical mechanisms associated with different psychoses to very specific different kinds of impairment in that precision weighted balancing act. And you can kind of see how you might get different sorts of hallucinations, different sorts of, um, uh, of general disturbances, including delusions, uh, the same way. And, uh, and they look at the action of different psychotomimetic drugs, particularly ketamine, in that um, context. 
So what else can we say in the sort of general intro to PP? It is computationally feasible, at least on small scales. It's only approximating Bayes, and it's doing it in a, in a way that, uh, that is tractable enough, um, at least in small scale simulations, I have to add that. Um, there are some very detailed um, neuronal and process level proposals for how it might be being implemented by the brain. And I think in the end, that's where all the action is going to be. I think in the end, that's where uh, we'll be able to uh, see whether these stories actually have some plausibility as stories of particular kinds of things that uh, animals do. So. so summary so far, this is the end of that sort of let's get PP on the table so we can um, start talking about it a bit. Uh, the idea will be perception, and I've stuck this in, rich world revealing perception, because I think, you know, you could have simple things, bacteria and so on, that do a kind of perception, and I don't think that they're using uh, this kind of apparatus to do it. But, but when your perception reveals a richly structured world full of nested objects, tables with people, and laptops and so on, then I think we've got prima facie reason to think this might be a good model. Uh, so the idea is that uh, when you can generate the sensory data for yourself, uh, you get to perceive the world. Uh, this is very much like the Max Clouds, Ramesh Jain slogan that perception is a form of controlled hallucination. That uh, your brain tries to guess what's out there and to the extent that the guess matches and explains away the waves of sensory evidence, you get to perceive the world. Um, so as a way of uh, showing what a difference this kind of prediction can make to perception, I just give you one quick clip of sine wave speech. Some of you will have heard this stuff before, um, but you might not have heard these examples. Let's see anyway. See if it works even. Never tested the sound. <laughs> okay, you come in, we come in a bit too quick. Oh, no, it's okay. So let me just pause it <coughs> just to explain in case you haven't heard clips like that before. So what you get, first of all, is a sort of a, a, a version of a sentence that actually has a lot of the acoustic information stripped away with just the kind of skeleton left. Then you get the sentence um, itself, then you get the stripped down version again. And the idea is, or the normal effect is, you find it hard to understand it the first time around, then you get, you know, you sort of ch tweak your generative model, because you've got a really good one already for language, you're not far away from being able to do this. So you give it just that little tweak, then you've got a good model uh, that works in this context, then you hear it again. Um, the claim that I want to make here is that's what perception is all about, really, that sort of structured encountering of a, a world is all about bringing an app model to bear, and that maybe this gives you uh, a sort of quick flavour of what that might be like. So I'll get it to do one more, now I've actually explained. It was a sunny day and the children were going to the park. It was a sunny day and the children were going to the park. It was a sunny day and the children were going to the park. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. He was sitting in the best of his life. So there's lots of other these, but we won't spend too much time on them. Um, the, so some people can actually hear this correctly first time around, which is interesting. Um, and there is some work on, on people that are non-clinical voice hearers uh, that, uh, that suggest that they normally can hear this first time around. They may be extra sensitive to kind of information encoded. In, uh, in sentences um, and anyone can get themselves into a position where they'll be able to hear these things anytime just by practicing a bit um, so it's a, a interesting area I think anyway just a, just a demo no difference to the Dalmatian really just in sound okay so um, evidence for predictive coding in the brain I've cut this greatly we'll come to more of it at the end um, Typical kind of evidence is a sort of suppression of low level response when higher level stuff seems to have settled into a grip on how it thinks the world is. And the kind of idea would be you get these sort of 
characteristic fMRI profiles here and the sort of the, the, the fact that you're getting less activity with improved performance um, is best explained by the activity actually being mostly prediction error. So as the error gets suppressed, you get less activity in low level areas, um, but that's then accompanied by better and faster and more um, effective performance. So that seems to be a sort of profile that, uh, that kind of fits this picture rather well and provides some evidence for it. Mookley and colleagues in Glasgow have been doing some of this work. Um, Mookley says, finding reduced activity related to increased performance fits well with predictive coding, but it's hard to explain otherwise. Uh, I think that's right. Um, and there's loads and loads of results like that. Repetition suppression has been a nice paradigm in the early days of this stuff. Um, it's well known that stimulus evoked neural activity is reduced if you repeat the stimulus. Um, for a long time that was thought to be something to do with fatigue or something like that, neuronal fatigue. Um, but in 2008, Summerfield and colleagues manipulated the likelihood of the repetition. And what they showed is that the repetition suppression um, profile only, um, only kicks in when the repetition uh, itself is, is, unexpect is expected, I should say. So that, that profile is reduced when the repetition is improbable or unexpected. The uh, best sort of explanation of that seems to be that repetition is reducing evoked response o only when it reduces prediction error. So it will be a kind of effect of this sort of regime in the brain. And finally, in terms of this, I mean, I will come back to more recent bodies of evidence at the end, but um, I'm quite interested in, in responses that track emissions. They are another whole class of responses that seem to me to favour this kind of model. So um, if a strongly predicted sound, or a lot of people here working on music, you know, where you get a sequence of tones or something and then uh, one is missed out, then the responses to silence often resemble those elicited by the predicted but absent sound. Um, I think that notion of detecting a very specific absence seems to cry out for something like a predictive model. Certainly you can't detect a particular absence without a model of some kind, um, I think. Okay. So, you know, if PP is on track, then this story is supposed to be a very big one. The idea is that um, processing in every brain area and at every level reflects the influence of these downward flowing predictions may or may not be all about downward flowing prediction. We can, we can talk about that. But it would certainly reflect the operation of downward flowing prediction. So it's a very strong claim. The idea is that it's not just a sort of trick for dealing with extremely noisy or highly ambiguous situations. It's just kind of business as usual. Fundamental, some people say this, it's a fundamental operating principle of the brain and underlies the whole of perception, thought and action. Okay. These black slides are to remind me to stop and breathe now and again. So. <laughs> I've learned how to ignore them now. <laughs> right. So, um, so a bunch of puzzles and then those worries about falsification and, uh, and then we'll, we'll stop. Okay. So, one worry that you might have from a sort of embodied cognition perspective is that this all sounds very sort of model driven, kind of highly intellectualized. What about all the stuff from, um, from sort of embodied cognition, all that stuff on just good enough response, embodied action, active vision, etc. Um, so my view is that this is actually a very good match. And in fact, the reason that I'm interested in these stories is precisely because I think this is a very good match. Deep down, I think these are the stories that bring perception and action so close together and weave them into cycles in which you're trying to reduce prediction error by engaging the world, that I think they might give us some way of sort of quantifying embodiment, if you like, making very precise predictions. So the important thing, I think, to get into the embodied cognition side of this is to realize that the goodness of your predictive model here is determined not just by, if you like, um, how good it is at predicting, but how cheap it is at predicting as well. So it's accuracy minus complexity that determines the goodness of a model. Um, free energy here is accuracy plus complexity. You know, that term. So the goodness of a predictive model is accuracy minus complexity. Accuracy is just getting the, the task salient sensory flux right. Complexity is how much firepower you have to use to do it. Um, 
So some people talk about this as applying an Occam factor to the prediction task, and there's of course um, Lex Luthor or Occam. <laughs> so the flexible way to do that is by assigning high precision only to the prediction errors whose resolution is estimated as useful for the task at hand. And that's the trick that I see being used again and again and again. It enables you to fit these kinds of stories to actually just about any behavioral profile you like. So that's obviously going to be a plus and a minus, as we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so here's a, an example, catching a, a fly ball in baseball, nice old ecological kind of uh, example. There's a simple, efficient strategy. Uh, optical acceleration cancellation seems to have won over the other simple, efficient strategy that was a competitor for a while. Uh, so you run so the ball looks to be moving at a constant speed through the visual field. Um, so outfielders aren't very good at predicting where the ball will land. They do very badly if, they, if you just make them stand still and say where the ball's going to land. On the other hand, they're good at running to catch the ball. There's the same kind of strategy that is celebrated by work in ecological psychology, getting the gamut to fold its wings at just the right time before it hits the water so it can reach the prey without breaking its wings off. So the lesson, so you might think that the lesson there is that these aren't prediction-based tasks. That would be a, a kind of natural thought. But I think the right way to think about them under the sort of action-oriented predictive processing story is that um, the choice of what to predict and when is crucial here. So the idea would be that the brain recognizes the context as apt for the use of a very simple, low-cost, low-parameter predictive strategy. Um, in the baseball case, that means giving high weight into a certain subset of prediction errors, the ones associated with the actions that implement optical acceleration cancellation. So it's pretty easy to actually see how to implement this sort of strategy switching using the same kind of Bayesian, broadly Bayesian apparatus. Um, you kind of you estimate what strategy reduces the greatest amount of task salient uncertainty for the lowest cost. Uh, that turns out to be a good route to strategy selection, one that's been explored in work by, um, by Dorr and others. So the idea would be that in the baseball case, you recognize the context, you apply this sort of almost this low cost strategy. Um, precision variations enable that strategy to control action, but of course, the other strategies are available in the system. So if prediction <coughs> error emerges that isn't quashed in that way, then it gets driven further up the system and can recruit a bit more cognition, if you like, or more reflection uh, to the point where you just pull more and more stuff in until you get rid of the prediction error or else you realize that you're failing with this problem and have to drive learning. Uh, so what's interesting here, I think, is that the strategies that PP gets to implement because it's got the precision weighting tool and it's wrapping action into the story they encompass things that look very knowledge rich, but also things that look very knowledge sparse. Um, and I think that there might be a sort of reconciliation here between the more ecological um, approaches to adaptive response and the more heavy duty um, information theoretic kind of approaches. There's some roboticists working on this stuff. Um, Pazulu, Giovanni Pazulu is, I think, doing most of the interesting work here at the moment. So what that means, I think, is that these systems aren't committed to what um, Anderson calls richly reconstructive models of what the brain does. They're sort of on the right side of the embodied cognition um, wars, if you like. So a richly reconstructive model would be one that lets the system get enough information in so it can solve the problem just using the information in its head, if you like. That would be richly reconstructive. Um, but these systems don't seem to be like that. They use sensing to deliver a more action-based grip on the world. You select a low-cost strategy that rolls in the action, that solves the problem using, um, using a, a simpler, um, extended over time, action-evolving solution. Okay. So at that point, extended and situated cognition get into the act pretty easily, because as long as that regime is selecting actions, the actions could wrap in stuff in your environment like iPhones and notebooks and pocket calculators and spell checkers and so on. Um, so any amount of reliable environmental structure can get factored in so that the, the bio strategy that is selected to solve the problem is one that leans heavily on the presence of those resources. Okay. 
So that, I think, means that uh, all of the sort of uh, Otto and Inger and leaning on the abacus and leaning on other people and using uh, smartphone type examples get uh, dealt with in that way. Okay. Very old picture of me and, uh, and Dave Chalmers. <laughs> Dave when he actually had the long hair. Yeah. Um, situated cognition kind of falls into place because we, kind of, we, we clearly structure our world deliberately so as to make low-cost solutions available. So the white lines along the, sort of, uh, along the roads on uh, Route 1 would be a nice example of this. So by structuring your environment in a certain way, you make available the low-cost solution that enables a cheap predictive strategy to get to grips with the problem. So if you put that all together, you get what I will call PP Max, a story that covers perception, action, Attention here just is this precision weighting tool. So the idea is that those waves of variable precision weighting, they just are the waves of fluctuating attention, if you like, in the system. Um, it accommodates all these different strategies from model sparse to more embodied to, um, to model rich. So it's big. It's very big. Um, and the question would be, has it got too big to be um, falsifiable or too big to be interesting? Um, and so on. So that's the bit get to now. So, another dark side. You've got two dark sides. Well, this is the same dark side I mentioned earlier. So, I'll look at three different puzzles here. The first one, in some ways the easiest one, I think, is the idea that these stories might seem unacceptably conservative, because if all that the system's trying to do is minimize prediction error, you might think that, that that's a recipe for a very, very, very boring life, perhaps, uh, perhaps a fatal one, you know, it depends on how you, how you play the story here. Um, but we don't just seek out an empty, darkened room and stay there. Uh, and yet you might think, that, well, you know, with the sensory flux not changing, surely you'll be uh, able to reduce prediction error very successfully. So I think the getting out of the darkened room in this sense is, is multiply overdetermined. There are just so many ways to make sure the system isn't going to do that. Um, part of the worry there is resolved by adding the stuff that Anil Seth and uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett are looking at about interceptive prediction. So maybe I sort of predict that I will be fed and watered. And if being fed and watered doesn't happen, then I generate high precision prediction errors in train actions that try to remedy the situation. Um, so that's enough, I think, to get you out of the fatal darkened room. It's not enough yet to get you out of the merely boring darkened room, where you actually do get enough food and water and all your interceptive needs are, are met and so on. Um, but I think there is a good way out of that, and it's to take some lessons from work in developmental robotics and so-called artificial curiosity, where the kind of picture they have is that what what is built into the brain, if you like, is to seek out, it's, it's not really to try to minimize prediction error, but it's to try to find good slopes for the minimization of prediction error. So you want to find environments in which you can minimize more prediction error than you expected, something like that. Um, you don't want an environment where you're getting loads of prediction error that you can't deal with, and you don't want an environment where um, you can easily deal with everything because you won't learn anything there. So it does seem to be the case that we humans tend to prefer, in context variable ways, these sorts of um, so-called kind of um, complexity sweet spots between stuff that you can't deal with and stuff that's too easy to deal with. So it's easy to implement that by making sure that your uh, little robots look for good slopes of prediction error minimization. And I think that's the most potent route out of the darkened room because it gets you out of the life-sustaining but merely boring ones. Um, that said, everything can be hijacked, you know, so, uh, so perhaps certain kinds of uh, rather addictive video game are giving us very nice slopes of prediction error minimization and you can get locked into a darkened room with those for quite a long time. Um, so I think anything's hijackable, but um, not all the time. So. Uh, second puzzle is kind of, this one's been coming up a bit today, so at first I cut some of these slides out and I put them back in. Uh, so a core attraction of PP is its apparent unifying potential, but you might well suspect that, uh, that we've kind of cheated a bit here, that we've taken a lot of things that are very different from one another and kind of found a way to talk about them as if they're all prediction. 
Um, you know, I think there's some truth in this, actually. Except I think it could be a good thing. Uh, so, for example, PP, if you were looking at the motor control stuff, talks about proprioceptive predictions that act as motor commands. And that's a, a workable thing close to the equilibrium point sort of stories. It's more like equilibrium trajectory kind of stories. Um, but you could recast all that talk as uh, reference signals that determine set points or set trajectories for motor control. So you don't need to talk about prediction error minimization there. Um, ditto for interoceptive predictions that's studied by NSF and others. You could recast those as homeostatic and anesthetic set points. So again, there's a perfectly good vocabulary for talking about those. Um, issue arises a bit in philosophy of science work on PP where some people have said, look, who says that unification is a scientific good worth pursuing? You know, maybe we should let a thousand different scientific flowers or theories bloom. Um, what's, the, what's the proof that there's a, a payoff for pursuing unification? So my own feeling about this, but it needs a lot more work to show it, or I, I think it will just show itself where it was as time goes on, actually, it's not that work's going to really solve this. But, the power of the, the framework, I think, is it allows you to think about really diverse strategies in a kind of common currency, something like that. So you, you can take these genuinely diverse strategies, translate them into this sort of framework, and then maybe see how one of these strategies relates to others. Maybe see how the whole um, brain, complete with many of these different strategies, can self-organize um, by uh, if you like, taking prediction error signals as a kind of common base for, uh, for response. So maybe there's a kind of Rosetta Stone kind of thing here. Maybe you can think of it as a sort of a, a way of understanding how the different stuff fits together. That would be the idea anyway. Um, a vision of PP that does justice to cognitive diversity. This is what you see. You don't really see anyone trying to wash out the differences between um, neural areas, for example. They just want to understand what those different areas are doing in terms of different kinds of prediction. One area specializing in one kind of prediction, uh, one kind of time scale, and so on. OK, and a third puzzle. This is the, um, this is the falsification kind of worry. So, you know, there's a very powerful vocabulary here, also a powerful mathematics here that does accommodate all of these different stories, stuff that looks model sparse, stuff that looks model rich, um, motor control, perception, reason, if you think of it as sort of seeding your own generative model and running it offline a bit. Um, so a question that lots of people ask is, you know, does this make it impossible to falsify PP? And actually, yeah, one thing that I should also say here is that the appeal to precision weighting is a particular hostage to fortune because it's such a powerful tool. Um, by varying the precision weighting, you can actually get one of these architectures to do just about anything that you want it to do. It's the sort of worry that people had about sort of early days connectionism as well. Um, so, yeah, they enable these principled shifts from you know thrifty model sparse to more demanding model rich responses. They show how we might start to seek out good information. There's a lot of nice work on epistemic foraging, um, how and when we'll retrieve information from the world rather than exploiting the information that we have, and so on. So th do they look like a kind of free parameter that you can just get to fit anything? Well, I think at a certain level, at the level of, of what I'm saying, for example, yes, that's exactly what they would be. Um, but as soon as you start to look at a particular implementation in neural and bodily machinery, then at that point I think they become falsifiable and testable. Um, so what I think happens here is that you've got to take a sort of two-step process. One is you start to settle on implementation proposals, and then domain by domain and task by task, you test the, the PP sort of um, schema, if you like, um, by applying it, using those implementation proposals in a consistent way to multiple domains. So there's uh, some bits of work that I think are pointing us in the right direction here. There's some nice work on um, lower level macaque face processing, visual area M1, that seems you, so you can find responses in M1 there that are uh, reflecting face tuning properties that are clearly being computed at much higher levels. There's no evidence of them being computed as low as M1. 
But they are finding good evidence for errors at that level that are possible only relative to those predictions that seem to be computed from higher levels. So there's some, that's some rather nice recent work. Um, there's some nice stuff by Hasmer and colleagues just out, so I'm going for some recent stuff here. They tried to test the ideas about precision weighting and dopamine using fMRI with a, a kind of associative learning task in the dopamine antagonist to see what happens if you kind of um, downregulate the dopamine. And what they said is, we find precision weighting of prediction error signals in superior frontal cortex and DACC modulated by the dopamine receptor antagonist. The findings provide evidence in favor of a role for dopamine. Surprise, surprise. But it fits uh, the, the PP model quite well. And something that I hesitated to include here because I haven't learned enough about it yet, but, uh, but this is a good place to talk about it, I think, given lots of people here working on um, frontal cortex. So something just out by Alexander and Brown models frontal cortex function using, and I think this is important, a single parameterization of uh, a sort of PP model. So they, they parameterize it in a single way, and then they use that parameterized model to um, fit or to, if you like, um, accommodate to explain lots of different kinds of behavior behavior that spans different kinds of neuropsychological experiment, different kinds of behavioral data. So that seems interesting. They see this as a, a novel unifying account of prefrontal cortex function. What they're really saying, which it was a surprise to me, is that they think prefrontal cortex predicts prediction errors. Um, they think that, uh, that it's basically in the business of, of, of predicting how the prediction error signal should itself be unfolding. Uh, so that it's, if it's not unfolding the way that you predicted, you can, if you like, recruit stuff to take action to repair that situation. Um, right. So anyway, all this stuff will become easier if and when the field converges on stable implementation proposals. Um, and I think they are getting increasingly stable. But um, we should talk more about that. It'll also help to have more powerful kinds of scans. So uh, Lars Mookley, who I quoted earlier, um, is very keen on the use of a, a particularly powerful scanner in Glasgow that he thinks can separate out prediction and prediction error responses within cortical levels. So that would be a, a, a useful thing to do. So the bottom line, I think, is that the model is testable, but only case by case in ways that are informed by implementation proposals. I don't think it's testable in any other way. Um, partly because it's too powerful. It really can, you know, be tweaked to fit any kind of pattern that you like otherwise. Um, the other thing that I don't see people doing that clearly needs to be done is to compare the predictions of the, the sort of PP model here with very near variant stories. So stories that don't perhaps um, combine top down and bottom up in quite the same way as PP does. Um, or things that carve up the information flow a little bit differently. So Michael Spratlin has a model like that, uh, the so-called um, predictive coding bias competition model. And uh, David Heger in New York has a, a, a model that, again, it behaves very much like these models, but not quite. Um, one of the differences is that his model can run in pure feed-forward mode, and these can't. Um, so it would be nice to do Bayesian model comparison over a sort of bunch of tasks where the models you compare with are, are the near variants rather than just something like, I don't know, it's all the just feed forward feature detection or something. Good. Um, lots and lots of outstanding issues. Um, I've not said anything about goals and motivations. They seem like a big bit of cognition. Uh, so can we reconstruct those using this apparatus? What about the cognitive role of self-directed language? I think there's stuff that can be said there. You, you might start to think of language as a way of sort of deliberately manipulating your own precision estimation. So I throw words at myself and I change the way precision is assigned in my own processing. So it's a bit like I've got an extra artificial way of modifying my own precision weighting. Uh, not just sort of neurotransmitter economies, but, um, but these sort of artificial neurotransmitter economies of words. Uh, then there's agency self-conscious experience, our current project that I promise not to talk about and I won't. Um, but can this say anything about consciousness? Um, but on the whole, I think maybe this is a, a sort of glimpse of some
processing motifs that might be present in an awful lot of what brains are doing, um, and that's the current interest in it. So that's the end of it. Thank you. So, uh, it seems like you headed off my question a bit there with uh, the introduction of this uh, idea that this doesn't, you're not quite clear on how this might explain goals and motivations. Okay. That seems like it's a really hard and kind of defining task for the rest of the uh, good predictive uh, yeah. model that you've got there, predictive story that you've got there. Yeah. If, if, it's, yeah. if we are making predictions that are task oriented, seems like a lot of these tasks are highly defined by their goals, even if we can't yeah. explain where those goals come from. Well, I guess my question is, where do you think these goals might come from in this sort of model? So I can give you what the sort of party line is on it, and then you can just see what you make of it. Um, so the party line is that um, goals just are predictions. They're predictions of my own future behavior, and uh, they entrain certain kinds of action at the right time so as to minimize errors with respect to those longer term predictions. Uh, so it has a slightly odd conceptual feel. It means that um, you know, I, I kind of, I start to take the actions that will bring about the future that I predict that I'm going to have, if you like, and that that's a causal mechanism. It's a, it's a motor control mechanism writ kind of very large. So, you know, their picture of motor control is you predict the, the proprioceptive trajectory of signals that you would have if you were to do such and such a thing. And, and you bring the act, or the action is brought about by the minimization of errors relative to those predictions. Um, you can do the same thing at long temporal scales for uh, more agentive selfie stuff, is, uh, is what they say, but I don't see how to. Um, I don't see right now what should make me either believe that or not believe it. Because I was uh, just going to follow up real quick that the concern that I have is I oftentimes watch YouTube or listen to music with shuffle features implemented yep. in there. So it seems like I'm intentionally disturbing my ability to predict what's going to happen next. Oh, that's okay. That's because you predict that you will have certain disturbances to your ability to predict. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just like, you know, when you go on the, on the fairground ride, you predict a certain kind of surprise. There will be other kinds of surprise that you really don't want to have. <laughs> yeah. So Williams has his new paper, um, Predictive Processing and Higher Order Cognition. And in his paper, he argues that predictive processing may have problems with things like compositionality and generalizability. And he says so because, they, because predictive processing yeah. is in some sense equivalent to these probabilistic graphical models. Yeah. And I kind of wanted your take on, one, uh, how predictive processing may account for our higher order cognition, and two, do you accept that argument that predictive processing is equivalent to PGMs? Yeah. I wouldn't consider myself competent to answer the latter of those okay. questions. It looks to me like it probably is equivalent, but I wouldn't be sure of that. Um, the First bit of the question, the thing about dealing with higher cognition, I guess I well, I haven't read that paper. Um, what's higher cognition? Just so that I so that we're, we're in the same ballpark, like like algebra or oh, he, he's kind of talking about the normal kind of concept related things, like uh, being able to generate abstract concepts or concepts being compositional in character and language being. Uh, productive and systematic, those kinds of things. Well, I mean, the funny thing about that is that stuff seems to me to fall out rather naturally from these kinds of things. So, you know, you're, you're, the higher levels of the generative model will be um, traded in stuff that is intuitively more abstract, is integrating information of more rarefied kinds across longer time scales. Um, and the sort of structuredness and nestedness of, of, of sort of. Yeah. Isn't systematicity just there in any generative model? Isn't that what generative models kind of are? They give you a systematic way of creating um, things like this out of these sorts of ingredients. Um, I mean, maybe there's some sort of, you know, no limit systematicity that may that I don't see evidence for in uh, in, in real cognizing systems. But just the idea that you can 
you can sort of generate new holes from your grip on the parts. That's, you know, that's what generative models are good for. So, so I, I don't know, am I missing part of the challenge there? I don't think so, but uh, I, I, his argument, I think, has been to hold, but something we can talk about, maybe offline. Okay, cool. I wasn't keeping a good grip on who's who there, but okay, right. Um, so I'm interested in the, the issue of gender models and how they're represented, how you select between them, especially at the higher levels. It does sort of seem like they're discrete models that are sort of flipped between, you know, it's the Dalmatian model and the, the nothing, the dots, or you know, the sentence and the noise. Um, do you think that they're discrete, and if so, how are we sampling those? Sam Warren has a, has a 2016 paper, um, Bayesian Brain Without Probabilities, I'm sure you're familiar. Um, and the idea that we can sample it still doesn't seem to solve to me the issue of needing a mechanism that compares the errors between different models and chooses which one it wants to pick, or at least some sampling mechanism. And then once you go there, it sort of becomes an infinite regress. But at any point, you need another mechanism for sampling yeah. for the, the lower level. That, that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I, I think what I want to say about that is that it's kind of wrong to think of these systems as harboring multiple generative models. I think they're best thought of as a single generative model. Um, that doesn't in itself tell you how to nuance that model for, if you like, different contexts at different times, but that's just part of the knowledge that's in the model. So just like there's no issue for a sort of language model of something like, you know, should I be using word level knowledge right now, or, or is letter level knowledge more apt for solving this problem, you know, that the solution to that is sort of wrapped in to the, to the algorithm that it is. Um, that's what you would expect of the one big generative model here, that those solutions are kind of wrapped in. Um, that's, not, that's not to build one, <laughs> you know. It's, uh, it would be a very daunting task to build even a small kind of thing that has to do sorts of properties. But, but I don't see a kind of conceptual challenge there exactly, unless it's a sort of version of something like the frame problem. Um, to me, it seems like you, you keep getting back to some level of abstraction where you, yeah. you hierarchically you need to then have yeah. a model that's sort of a model of everything all at once. <coughs> well, it, yeah. yeah, it is supposed to be that, I think. Um, yeah. you know. So you look at, it's only minor evidence, but the sort of, <coughs> you know, the, the stuff where they train ferrets on movies, and so they sort of showed the the young ferrets, uh, different sorts of movies of natural scenes, and after a certain amount of exposure, spontaneous cortical activity in the trained up ferrets um, was sort of different in ways that matched the, the properties of the scene. So you could tell which set of scenes they'd been exposed to by looking at their spontaneous cortical activity. Suggestion there is that there is, if you like, a, a kind of trace of your whole grip on the world in, uh, in the organization there. Don't know if that's, if that's evidence or not. Good to bring ferrets in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Um, there was an order there. Unless it's a follow up. Do we do that? Yeah. Whatever you want to do. Do we do that? I mean, in philosophy, there's a finger or a hand. <laughs> <laughs> a finger is a follow up, and a hand is a whole new quest. <laughs> 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 Me? Yeah. Okay. So um, I have a feeling that you have a pretty accurate prediction of what I'm about to say um, <laughs> already. So I'm, in general, still worried that we're trapped in the dark room. Mm -hmm. And exposition, exposition you gave, which was great, um, and I thought really, really nice and highly persuasive, was one that moves from very detailed and highly plausible stories about perception. Mm -hmm. to a generalized account of my body and behavior. Yep. Right? <clears throat> and then my worry is, is always going to be action. And when it comes to action, um, we need some kind of motivators. And we've got the, the problem of trying to figure out where the motivators come mm -hmm. from. Right? Um, the motivators are going to set a target, right? a behavioral target that the creature then 
works toward attaining. So let me offer a suggestion for what to me sounds like a plausible way of handling this that's not incompatible with the predictive processing model. <clears throat> um, and I think the word, what's causing a lot of the problem is just the word prediction. Because um, it works great for perception, but we start running into these problems with action because the word prediction doesn't get at what we need. So when we're doing perception, we've got a top-down expectation, and the activity is one of matching the bottom-up, uh, so, sorry, matching the top-down prediction um, with the bottom-up sensation. Right? So we finally, have, there's a little error there, and we recycle until we get a match, and then things are good once we get the match. Okay, <clears throat> when we're dealing with action, right, we have a top-down prediction, right, or better referred to as some kind of behavioral target, right, um, <clears throat> in the form of an expectation about the kind of perceptual input, the perceptual experience we want to have, right? So I want to have the perceptual experience of eating a cheeseburger, say, so my behavioral target is one of getting to the point where I'm having that experience, right? And so what we're doing is starting with, we're doing the opposite, right? So we're starting with a top-down prediction, right? A behavioral target, and we're taking action until the bottom-up experiences, sensations, match that yeah. prediction, <coughs> yeah, that's right. right? So that's my kind of simple way of trying to reframe this in such a way that allows for action, although we still have the missing motivators problem, or as you used to call it in the DBS piece, the desert landscape problem. Um, but assuming there's something that provides the motivator to establish a behavioral target, we have to make a distinction between a defeasible prediction yep. to match the bottom up, or a fixed prediction and then defeasible sensory input that's defeasible and or changeable because of action to match that target at the top. Does that make sense? Most of it did, then I got <laughs> a little bit lost towards the last sort of cycle of it. So, because it sounded to me like what you were describing just was the PP story about action, which is that you change the world to fit the prediction, as it were. Um, in motor action, the world is your body, if you like. So you yeah. change your bodily state to fit the prediction. In sort of more abstract kind of action, you change the, the sort of worldly state. You know, I kind of predict that I'm eating the hamburger. I change the worldly state until the eating the hamburger is the way the world is. Or, yeah. You know, I, okay, so then yeah. if that's okay, then the that's, only... That's a story. That's Yeah, that's yeah so then the only difference in our views then yeah. comes down to the try, you know, so I'm, I'm very open yeah. to the source of the motivators, and you know, Friston is a little bit more hamstrung in what he yeah. can, where he can source the motivators from. Right. And so we've got, we, we still have the motivators mm -hmm. issue, which I think we yeah. don't agree upon, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a party line. Um, replace the motivators with predictions. Uh, why not? Yeah. So, but. Uh, Pre pre conceptually, a prediction is yeah. completely different from a motivator, right? Except insofar as you're motivated to reduce uh, reduce the error differential, right? And that's a different kind of thing. Um, right. I probably uh, talked about. Maybe I've just got used to it. You know, it doesn't seem, <laughs> doesn't seem different to me anymore. It just okay. seems like. Uh, seems like it's a way of uh, unpacking what a motivator might be because just saying that they're motivators doesn't really tell you much either you know yeah. um, at least when you think that they're sort of uh, high level predictions that want to entrain behaviors that will change the world to fit with the prediction you, you can sort of at least use the same apparatus um, but I agree, there's always this question, you know, where do they come from, why do they have the shape they have? But that's the same issue for people that think that, you know, that motivation is a kind of independent axis here. So I think that's sort of, it's almost like there's a picture where it's all, it's all something like um, beliefs, pretty well. You know, it's all, it's all something of that sort of cognitive nature. Um, and then there's the other picture, no, there's two very different kinds of cognitive thing here. And one is a sort of belief-like thing, and the other is a desire-like thing. Um, 
Yeah. We won't resolve that. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, so now I do retain a trace, which was the week uh, over there and then, uh, yeah. So, um, I think it was just a clarification question. Um, at lunch and then uh, early in the talk, you talked about um, sort of hierarchical predictions. Yeah. Uh, but then in the first question, you clarified that, that the best way to think about this is as a single generative model. Yeah. And so I guess I'm just wondering. Um, With multiple levels, obviously. I mean, it's a, it's a hierarchical generative model. Well, uh, I guess that's my, my clarification question is, do you see these levels as being um, sort of independent predictions that need to represent the prediction in some way, as opposed to just interactive systems that, that final prediction errors between themselves, right? So the reason I'm wondering that is because if we think PFC needs to be its own machine that operates on a different kind of signal, then yep. that might be a harder claim to, to work with than if it's all just Kind of a structure too. Right. I'm not sure I'm quite getting the, 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 so do the thing there. Do you think there are boundaries? Do you think there are yeah. you know, vacant features of the anatomy that, that um, establish some, some differences in uh, some boundaries between these predictions? Or is it something that's more dynamically emerging? I think that predictions are different things, right? So you might think that. Um, you might think that the hippocampus is in the business of predicting successor points or something like that, in the business of computing a successor relation. Um, and, you know, maybe PFC is in the, in the business of um, computing a, a flow of expected prediction errors or, or, or something. So as long as they're computing different things, however, if that gets unpacked, then it doesn't seem like the challenge is quite the same one. Um, I mean, one thing that is funny about thinking about it as hierarchical, of course, is that for a lot of the bits of this, there's no answer to the question where they are in the hierarchy. So it's not like it's not like a stepladder sort of hierarchy. Uh, but moment by moment, they do just have to be some sort of facts about how the information flows, so that some stuff, some bits of the flow, if you like, get to um, get to entrain other bits of the flow. So that's enough to give you a sort of effective hierarchy for the moment. Um, the precision weighting stuff, of course, establishes what the effective hierarchy is for the moment. So it's not a fixed hierarchy. It's a hierarchy that alters moment by moment according to this um, super powerful precision weighting tool. Um, so maybe that's part of the answer that you kind of think of a single distributed generative model such that there's, there's a kind of hierarchy there, but it's a temporary hierarchy. And also some stuff is even at the same level of the hierarchy at the same time. There's no problem with that either. Um, I don't know. Well, maybe there's a bit of that question you have that I'm missing. No, no, no. Yeah. I'm curious about um, how you were pointing out that uh, if a system gets really good at making these predictions, um, it maybe finds the right context in which you can have really low prediction error all the time. It's going to have a boring life and maybe even worse. And so you may need to inject into the model something that is more curiosity driven, an extra parameter that makes it occasionally. like in a slope. Yeah, try to find the right balance of getting some prediction error occasionally because it's healthy. Yeah. That's how you learn. Yeah. Maybe it's connected to something like confirmation bias that. Uh, <laughs> That, that a lot of times when, when yeah. you set with some tests to figure yeah. out uh, what theory yeah. is true about a situation, yeah. people will often try things that uh, are not likely to disconfirm their bias and therefore not <laughs> likely to give you a high prediction error. Yeah. And, and so the step next I want to take with that question is, are you aware of there being like individual differences research to show maybe some people who are more curiosity driven or less That's curiosity yeah. or, or thrill seekers yeah. or less thrill seekers? Yeah are better with things like confirmation bias or other kinds of uh, prediction yeah. situations. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I, I don't know of any such work, but there might very well be work like that. I mean, it sounds like sort of there ought to be, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank but, you for asking that question. That was exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> there's, um, there's definitely work on, 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 on sort of um, individual variation within a population and how that can be, if you like, beneficial to overall um, the sort of the, uh, the ability of the whole population to uh, successfully minimize prediction error in its encounters with its environment. So the kind of idea that you basically set your priors differently 
you have different expectations about surprise, for example, so that in a very volatile environment, um, you know, some of you are going to do uh, better than others, and in a very stable environment, some of you are going to do better than others. So it's good to have a spread of, of sort of um, a spread of uh, a spread of predictions about the spread of prediction error in yeah. your encounters with the environment. Um, so that stuff, some of that stuff has been modeled. Who does that? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I'm thinking that um, Thomas Fitzgerald does some of this in, in amongst the epistemic foraging stuff. So you have different patterns of epistemic foraging, obviously according to individual variations there. Um, but this is one for me to check in my extended mind get back to you on, but there is that. Um, what does that mean? Okay. Um, so I've had a lot of difficult time assessing, figuring out what I think about this view of attention. Um, and one of the reasons is that I'm not really sure exactly what the difference between top down and bottom of attention is on this view. Okay. And so it would help me if I could get a good sense of that. I asked Jakob Howie a few mm. years ago, because we were both comments, mm. commenting on a paper that was criticizing Jakob Howie's and this view of attention. Mm. And he said, no one in predictive um, land knows what to do with bottom up attention yet. Um, that was a few years ago, so you might have a stance on what bottom up attention is on this view. I'm just wondering if you could help fill in, like, what, so I understand, you know, top down would be predictive precision. Yeah. Um, and I, mean, I thought that I understood the view, and I suggested something for bottom of potential. I can't remember what I suggested. And you said, well, we don't really know what to do with bottom of yeah. yet. Do you have a. So, bottom of potential is just like attention capture, right? Yeah, that, so that, how that's does what we mean. So, like a loud bang captures my attention, and yeah. that's bottom up. Um, so, one thought that I've heard floated here is that that's just, as it were, a sort of a a prediction that's been kind of amortized in the history of the system, which is something like um, stuff like that is going to be salient. So, you know, so like pop out kind of examples as well. Um, so maybe some stuff is just sort of intrinsically salient to creatures like us because of our evolutionary history. You know, our bangs might be, might be one of those things, sudden movements in the periphery of my vision, you know, those sorts of things. It does seem like you might just be set up um, fundamentally to respond to those. Um, is that bottom-up attention? I, I don't know. Um, it's, you don't get to distribute that attention, that's for sure. That just happens. Um, it would be bad news, I think, if you've got too much of a say in that. Um, is that... Uh, what, do we need to say more than that, I guess, is my no, question that, back to helpful, you? Because that's, that's like, you know, that attention capture seems understandable in that way. I guess, okay, as you become expert in a task, then your attention will be captured by things that had nothing perhaps to do with your evolutionary history. So attention capture is trainable as well. That's got to be true. So then the question will be what goes on when attention capture gets trained? And I have to assume that that's to do with the kind of lateral connectivity in, uh, you know, so, so even though, you know, predictions and prediction errors are being passed up and down the system, they also get passed sideways. So you, 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 know, you do get, um, that's why different levels get to do different things, really. Um, so you probably can write quite a lot of that into the structure of the different levels, and maybe as expertise develops, you plug more of that into the structure of the lower levels. And that looks like um, attention capture. So that makes sense, can I ask a yeah. follow-up? So Bottom-up attention is predictive precision based on experience, basically. So you you notice that things that are red tend to be more precise, um, or okay. something like that. And so that's why red things capture your attention more than blue things, or something. Then what is top-down? What is predictive precision top-down based on, mm -hmm. if not experience? Um, also like based on experience, but more easily affected by what you're currently trying to do. You know, so it would be this idea that I plug a, a, a high level prediction in, which is something like, I don't know, I'm gonna I'm gonna solve this this new puzzle that I've never encountered before. Um, and then in order to do that I have to distribute attention rather deliberately. Um, so I think there's a good question what deliberate distribution of attention here is. It has to mean something like attention which is being 
um, directed by very high level predictions. Um, but there's still predictions about where the good information is relative to the task. So it will be something like, you know, I think I can reduce my uncertainty with respect to this new executive puzzle by twiddling it in this way. Um, so I briefly attend to that possible twiddle. Um, so it should all be about should all be about estimating uncertainty in ways that are um, task variable, but also you have this whole sort of swathe of automatic uh, estimations that are, are plugged in at the lower levels. I don't know. Is it really? You know, you can be dubious about the whole picture of attention, but I don't. I don't kind of see that there's any particular challenge about bottom up or top down attention. They're they're both. They're both dealt with in the same way. So I'm, I'm wondering why Yakov thinks that there's a special problem. I'm just trying to see if it maps on to evidence about attention. Because that's one thing right. I'm figuring out okay. theory yeah, yeah. is that we have all this evidence about right. attention. Does it really yeah. capture mm -hmm. the evidence? Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I can follow up on the email. Yeah, that would be interesting. I mean, I, I, I got the nasty suspicion that it can fit all that evidence, but whether that counts as capturing it or not, <laughs> yeah. I, don't know, so I don't know how principled that the fitting will be. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, now we do have a, a, a bundle, so I think uh, behind, first of all, yes, <coughs> I'm the one. I kind of want to go back a little bit to Russ's question earlier. Um, and I think I may have just not understood your answer to it. So um, there, was, there was a distinction between the type of um, way that you address your, your uh, perception errors, right? Or so you have some sort of, when you're, when you're trying to commit an action, you have a prediction and then you do something to the world to address those errors. Whereas if you're doing some more perceptual task, you have some errors and then you change your model about how you think the world is, right? Okay. So you see the Dalmatian instead now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And those seem to be two fundamentally different strategies, yeah. which I'm not sure why, um, like, how do you know which one, when to pick which one? How does the generative model know which one to pick? Yeah, people do often ask that, and, I, and, and the answer, I think, isn't very, um, isn't very compelling, but I do think it's right. The answer is, that's part of the generative model, you know. <laughs> um, the knowledge the generative model has to embody in order to um, get you to behave appropriately in the world includes knowledge about when you should up update your sort of hypothesis and when you should act on the world. That's, that's just more knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of. That makes sense. Um, so, you know, um, what's the name there? Um, Pazulu and Gigliotti do have some of these simple robotics experiments, a kind of ongoing flow of them, and some of the simple experiments do have this sort of shall I act or shall I update my hypothesis thing, thing built in. Um, doesn't prove that you can do it in sort of very large scale cases just as easily, but certainly works in the small ones. That's my question. <laughs> um, that, yes. right, so this is kind of related to yeah. a number of things yeah. that the questions have been uh, raised already. Uh, in the perception action case, um, What's really elegant in this sort of predictive processing count is, of course, the perception action are speaking in the same units, yeah. right? So you can reframe the sensation to perception problem and the perception to action problem yeah. as something in which the units are mutually compatible. Yeah. But what do you, you know, how does the PP model account for generativity in systems where, the, in the brain, where you're not talking in the same currency? Right, so what, what the prefrontal cortex might be doing is you know, it has to be framed in the context of these units for, yeah. the, for the prefrontal cortex to solve. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering what your take is on what are the general units of predictive processing that there are, that there is such thing. Right. So, so is that a question about something like the format of representations? Or, yeah. Um, because I want to say that general units just are prediction errors, which can be, of course, calculated relative to any kind of prediction. So as long as you've got different kinds of prediction being computed, that common currency of error is is right. used. But they're in different but, units, but they, right? Like yeah. so, the, you know, visual prediction error be is very in different the, representational right. formats. I think That's correct. And so, do you need yeah. something in the brain to do these transformations? In which case. You have prediction as a fundamental problem in the brain, and the transformations which have to exist yeah. Yeah. in order to make prediction possible. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, I think, think that I sense. Think, what, think what is that? 
I think there's a genuine issue there that the brain must be solving if it's implementing this thing. And you get it just within the levels of the system without even worrying about, you know, moving out to other systems altogether. Um, Lars Mukli is someone that is looking at, at, at this particular issue. So it is sort of like, you know, is there a common currency here? Probably, probably not in representational terms. And if not, then, um, then how does it all actually work? Um, I, think it's, I, think, I think it's a challenge. I mean, in the small simulations, there doesn't seem to be a problem. So different levels manage to speak to each other. And uh, even though they're not using the same representational formats, um, they're kind of close enough, I suppose, to learn. Um, and then you've got sort of bigger pictures coming out of the, the Friston work at the moment where you've got um, discrete higher level models trying to predict continuous lower level models. And again, they've got simple simulations in which that seems perfectly workable. Um, so maybe, maybe the idea is, you know, as long as you know, the system is sort of trained under those conditions, it's, you know, it's got these signal passing capacities and it's got to learn how to use them in order to solve certain kinds of problems. And that means learning those transformations, learning how to, if you like, um, transform expectations of one kind into um, predictions that can be understood by a level that is trading in expectations of a different kind. That, but that, that, that must be going on in the small simulations that work. So, so the sort of hand wavy answer is, so why couldn't it happen in the big simulations too, like us? So I don't know if there's a special extra further problem when the sort of when the kind of the, the stuff they're trading in seems very very different, like prefrontal cortex and hippocampus, so, or something. But, but maybe not. Maybe the more different it is, the less hard it is in some way to to have relations between them, because all you need to do is a bit of sequencing or a bit of um, blocking or something. Don't know. Nice question. I'd like to go back to the testability yep. stuff. Um, I, I really like yeah. the you know getting down to implementations responses, the same sort of response that had to be made for things like the dynamical systems hypothesis and cognitive science yeah. and connectionism and so on. But I'm curious, can you characterize an experimental result that you would see as saying, oh well, that it's I guess it's not prediction everywhere because here's an example where it's not. Um, given that yeah. the predictions could be somehow reified through evolution, yeah. given that you know there's yeah. this scale of, of attention, yeah. what kind of result would make you conclude, oh well, this part doesn't really fall under this rubric? Yeah, I mean for me cases where you, you can solve the problem just by sort of bottom-up feature extraction with maybe some evidence accumulation would they seem to me to be different enough to not count, although someone like Carl Friston will say they're fine, they count because that's sort of amortized prediction or, you know, um, structurally imminent prediction. Um, but I think that those, you know, that where we find that, if we find that, that's just a different kind of strategy. Um, it's interesting, I think, that we maybe are going to find that less often than, you, than we thought. Um, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I like, for example, the face processing work that Egner and colleagues did a few years ago, um, basically showing the FFA that you might very well think of as a specialized face detection area. Its profile actually better fits being specialized for face prediction. So um, you get you know, greater activity there under high face prediction than you do under high facehood, if you like. Um, so, that, so that sort of thing suggests to me that probably, probably straightforward feed-forward feature sort of detection models are going to be the way that, that, that most of these things turn out. Um, but yeah, I mean, it seems to me that it would be very odd to to try and say that the shape of my finger is a prediction. But that is the kind of thing that Carl Dark does have to say. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So I think we have time for one more question in the formal Q and A. Oh, oh, but there's two people. Why can't we just do two? <laughs> yeah. um, to arc back to the attention that we were discussing earlier, um, from you were saying that attention is the actual prediction, e. right? 
Um, okay, let's say that for now. Yeah. Well, where was it the prediction error? It's the precision Pre of the prediction. Precision. Yeah. Okay. Attention so, is the process of optimizing the precision of the prediction error during problem solving. Okay. I, I suppose where I struggle like using like a like Bayesian generative model in this yeah. sense is like why like from this perspective would you actually have attention? Like wouldn't you want all of that information to actually enter right. the system yeah. rather than having attention as a filter on mm -hmm. the information that's actually being processed in a generative model? Yeah, I think that the reason is is to be able to use your generative model for many different purposes. Um, so if you look at the deep mind stuff, they don't have attention. They don't need attention in their models because um, basically their models are doing one kind of thing. Right. They do. But as soon as you want to sort of take a single generative model and purpose it for many, many different kinds of tasks, then I think you need something playing that role of sort of changing the patterns of information flow according to the task. And that's what that that's what that's trying to do. Um, so that's why I think you need it. I mean, you might think, well, it would, wouldn't it be better if you had everything all the time? But, but then you'd be failing the sort of uh, the kind of complexity tests and probably right. failing to do anything in real time. Right. So, but then it's like as a consequence, I suppose it requires an additional mechanism to essentially create that filter. Then, but I'm not sure. It's. Yeah, I mean, it's the same old sort of slightly boring response. It's part of the general, you know, <laughs> estimating how to assign precision and sure. part of what the generative right. model has to do. Right. Um, <coughs> but of course, you know, how that's actually implemented, probably all over the place. Um, right. the, the, the Friston folk think the Pulvinar does most of it, that actually precision assignment is kind of orchestrated, uh, computed mostly by the Pulvinar. But, it seems know, rather fluid, though, depending on the task. Yeah. I agree, I'm, I'm not convinced by that thing. Um, yes, there was one more. Should we do it? Yeah, let's do it. Last one. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I was kind of curious and just thinking about how, do you, how would you talk about predictive processing? For example, when you're looking at different agents, for example, in a search task. Um, so okay. let's say you have an agent who's very well adapted to your environment. And most of the time, in order for a lot of their goals, like let's say like, they're hungry, right? You don't need to sort of think about sort of like, they don't need to have like sort of like big goals and predictions, right? You can just have a slow memory sort of random levy walk and you can easily sort of achieve some sort of goal as opposed to an agent who can do either both. They can try to think what's the most optimal sort of search path today rationally like, or should it just take a random walk? Like how does the predictive model sort of deal with different agents in that way? So I suppose uh, in some sort of sub-personal way, you would want to say that some agents predict a random walk as a solution to this kind of problem, and other agents predict something more kind of structured and directed. And maybe that's part of this sort of spread of individual variation that seems kind of functional within a population. Um, but certainly the thing to say about the random kind of walk solution is that sometimes maybe the high-level prediction is precisely that that's, that's what ought to be done. Um, or some of it might just be built into the structure of the system so it falls on the other side of, of, of that divide. Um, yeah. But, yeah, nice, nice issue. Cool. Okay, so uh, we have the room till six, but uh, that's the end of the formal presentation. Let's okay. thank Andy Clark. Thank you.